Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox on a Blog to Watch. This is This Week in Watches. I'm joined by Josh Thanos of Watchbox and Gothberg. Welcome, hey Josh. Hey, Tim. Good to see you. Let me ask, were you expecting someone else? All the same, if you're taken aback to find me here instead of Blog to Watch's sedulous scribes, register your rancor and dismay at thewatchbox.com. That said, I think we've got a fun program for you tonight. I'm going to have to introduce some of the segments because I know many of you are joining us for the first time. But this is our news show. We're going to be talking about the events of the week that was in watches. The first thing I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to show you a wrist shot. Josh, what you got tonight? Uh, well, I'm double fisting it tonight. So uh, we'll start with my trusty favorite, actually my first Swiss watch I ever purchased, the Panerai 380, which is now I think the lowest price point Panerai that exists, which is a benefit. Uh, it's a stainless steel polished case, 45 millimeters. It's the OP Caliber 2 movement, 56 hour power reserve manual movement, though I, I tend to get a little bit more than 56, honestly. Well, now you showed us our dumb watch. Uh, show me the smart watch. Smart watch, which is the, really the only smart watch I've found that I like. Let's see if we can get a good wrist shot there. It's the Montblanc Summit, 46 millimeters. This is a special edition you can only get on their website. It has this uh, cool NATO type strap. And honestly, I don't know if you're like me, uh, but before about two or three weeks ago when I got this watch, I didn't even know it existed. But uh, it's a cool watch. It uh, pairs my iPhone with the Android Wear app. So functionality is somewhat limited, but it works for me. Get calls, texts on my phone, on my uh, my watch, and has become my work watch. Honestly, well, let me ask you a question. How long does the battery last? Uh, about a day. Okay. Yeah, well. that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> Sorry, the limits of tech. All right. That's right. Yeah. Well, today I'm wearing my JLC Reverso Platinum Number no. Two. It's a limited edition from 2003. I figure if I'm going into someone else's house, oh. I should wear my best. Hey. So you can see it's a little Grand Thai case in oh, platinum. Man. But the movement, a tourbillon in white gold, uh, I'd have to say I almost prefer it on this side, frankly. But it's a beautiful little stealth watch and probably takes pride of place in my collection. Chateau Lecoult, I love you. That's All awesome. right. So, yeah, I agree. It's your last pickup, right? Your latest? No, no, the Snowdrop. That's the vintage right. piece. Yeah, vintage you guys piece. know about that. Oh, yeah. By the way, subscribe to Watchbox Studios if you want to see us on a weekly basis. Shows five days a week. All right. So Josh also sells watches. He doesn't just buy smart watches. Mm -hmm. Remember, when you're ready to sell your watch, there is no better way than the watchbox.com. Buy, sell, or trade. Call this guy 24 hours a day. You're guaranteed to at least get the machine version of him. That's right. All right. So that said, we're going to play this or that. Josh, I think we need to explain first. Yes, let's uh, let's certainly do that. Okay, Go for it. this, that, or the other, as Seinfeld would have said. Let's start with the other. What it is? This or that is where I propose two watches to Josh, mm -hmm. and they usually compare and contrast in some thematic fashion. He has to pick the one that he would keep. So the thing is, this year, the Rolex Sea Dweller One Two Six Six Hundred is the new hotness. Mm -hmm. Wait list. Highly anticipated, 50th anniversary piece, very hot. But I have noticed that you could own the second son, not the original Rolex Sea Dweller, but the famed triple six that ran from 78 to about 88. So you could have a true transitional vintage Rolex that's still rugged enough to wear every day, and you could buy it now, mm -hmm. a great example, right. for the same price as the new 50th anniversary. So let's go through. Same retail price. Well, exactly. Right. It's, it's going to be a pre-owned watch and pre-owned by quite a margin, but mm -hmm. it's going to be about the same price. Remember, if you're waiting in line for the Rolex, you're going to get it at retail. If you want it right now, you're going to have to find someone to sell you secondary. That's right. Okay, so first thing, the Sea Dweller 43, it was the hotness of Basel World 2017. The watch everyone knew would happen, it happened, and there was no disappointment. Return of the Red Sea Dweller motif, a weightless watch. It's actually the first Sea Dweller with the Cyclops eye, which is practical and I have to say gives it a distinctive profile compared to its predecessors. 4,000 meter rating matches our vintage piece, addresses the reservations that some people had about the proportions of the deep sea and the relative proportion of the deep sea's lugs and bracelets. Mm -hmm. Aesthetically a success. Caliber 3235 quietly upgrades the movement, now a 70 hour power reserve with the Kroner G movement. And I should say modern day Rolex build quality puts everything to shame in caliber and consistency. Must be seen and scrutinized to fully appreciate. Right. I mean, every everything that comes out of Rolex today is is perfect. It's like perfect, like Dracula was created perfect. <laughs> the first vampire, Blade Three. See it. It's a good movie. Okay. So, bracelet and clasp. Right. Flip lock and glide lock. Yes. Built like a Brinks truck. 
substitutes as a brass knuckle, it's that tough, guys. Seriously heavy duty, hardcore, hard wear. Mm -hmm. This thing has glide lock and flip lock, which means you can get a cumulative two inches of extension out of it. Possibly the best clasp at any price on any watch. And at 11350 not now, not soon, and not without making friends with an authorized dealer, but you can get in line to buy one. Yeah. I will say, it's probably the watch of the year for a 2047, circa 2047 watch snob who has to choose in 30 years between a reference 336-600 with quantum caliber technology and a vintage Sea Dweller 43. The day will come, guys. The day will come. <laughs> okay, but for now, it's the new watch. The vintage choice, Josh, mm -hmm. is a Rolex Sea Dweller 666-1660. This watch came out in 1978. And it's not the original and better for it. The 1665 was limited in some ways that makes it wear vintage. This can be worn like a modern watch. It was uh, popular in a period that roughly corresponded to the era that Harold Ramis comedies ruled the box office. So I should, I should make note of that. I ain't afraid of no ghosts. But this is a good ghost. Like Casper, you're going to want this one around. The Sea Dweller 4000, as it's also known, was enough of an upgrade over the original that a well-kept example can still be worn without the reservations and the kid gloves of a vintage piece. Uh, really sits on the bubble, but on the right side of the bubble that separates, separates true vintage requiring special care and handling restrictions from a modern watch that you can wear every day. And it was the first Sea Dweller with a sapphire, unidirectional bezel, first with a high beat movement, first with a quick set, first model to be 4,000 meters rated, and I'll say still a good supply, minimal collector and auction interest, and real no need to settle for a basket case example. Mm -hmm. A great example with the triple six, you know, the later glossy dial box and papers is mm -hmm. like 11,500, the right. price of the Sea Dweller 43. Which one do you choose and why? Hmm. All right, so, well, the 43 millimeter new Sea Dweller has made an appearance on this or that bef uh, in the past, and okay. unfortunately that one lost against the Omega, right? The Planet Ocean Chronograph, which, both great watches, that one lost. Again, unfortunately that one will lose. Good news is we're doing Rolex against Rolex, so Rolex wins no matter what. Um, for me, I'm going for the uh, the triple six. The triple six is going to be much more wearable. Um, while the 43 is certainly, in my opinion, an upgrade from the 44 millimeter, uh, deep sea sea dweller, and and if it was presented that way, I think it would be marketed better, in my opinion. The it is kind of a somewhat of a downgrade, in my opinion, from the sea dweller 40, which is the ceramic version or the updated version of the I guess the triple six. Sure. So right? if you had your absolute preference, you right. would pick the late great sea dweller 40. That's right. But choosing between these two, and honestly, I'm. I'm becoming more of a fan of vintage watches. I see, obviously, you are as well. Um, I'd say the triple six is a great. It's a great uh, reference, like you said. It is gonna, certainly going to be wearable. It's going to be vintage, but not something you have to deal with in kick. It's not kick delicate. It, without any doubt, it's not delicate. And what we're seeing is, if you get ahead of these things, like similar, similar to like the Kermit and things like that. This watch is a watch that maybe 10 years from now is going to be a watch that is going to be trading for possibly double because you're going to see less and less of them out there, right? Yes. They only made it for roughly 10 years. So um, for wearability, for um, just cool factor, and if you can find it with box and papers, I'd say that the, uh, the triple six is the way to go for me personally. I have to echo that. I'll say this. Vintage Rolex is ultra hot right now. That doesn't mean there are not buys. Mm -hmm. Well, the matte dial triple sixes have been discovered and the secret's out. This is a great example of a relatively uncommon Rolex dive watch in steel that looks the part, plays the part, is absolutely a ton of fun, and you can get it for the rounding error of some of these auction watches that are going off right now. The bottom line is, this is still where you can find value and fun in vintage Rolex. Mm -hmm. The triple six, the dark knight, the truly dark knight. <laughs> Get the Prince of Darkness while you can, guys. Okay, so new watches, mm -hmm. I have to say, we have quite an interesting array tonight, and it starts with the Chopard LUC XP Arushi Year of the Dog. While they throw up the graphic, I wanna note that Avi B, joining us in our chat box mentioned that he went wreck diving and cave diving with his own triple six. See guys, they can still Good get job. it done. Absolutely. All right. Chopard LUC XP Arushi, a watch that's brand new from Chopard, continues their Chinese Zodiac series. This one isn't though so much East meets West as East meets East. Mm -hmm. It's actually a watch that corresponds to the 2018 symbol of the Chinese zodiac, but more from a Japanese perspective of craft and heritage than a, than a Chinese perspective. The watch is, I would say, hand-painted lacquer by Japanese Arushi pro 
process. Uh, a Japanese Akita dog as the focal point. Right. This is a watch that I think in 88 pieces is going to find most of its subscription in the Japanese home market. Oh, yeah. So this is a beautiful piece and flies a little bit under the radar. Interesting because uh, it was actually a project directed by Kiichiro Masamaro, who is uh, a master of the art. It was actually executed by Rushi Grandmaster Minori Kazumi and the Yamada Hainato company that actually works with the Japanese monarchy Gesundheit. oversaw this. Yes. <laughs> I, I think this is an interesting piece because it's a Chinese zodiac that just emphasizes, j just like with kanji characters, how much of Japanese character, like, like, I would say pop culture character right. is actually inherited from China. Mm -hmm. So an interesting piece on many levels. Uh, less about the movement this yeah. one, but it still satisfies the, satisfies the connoisseur with a micro rotor automatic caliber 9617. Micro rotor, I think stacked barrels, 65 hour power reserve. I think Chopard really spread the love here. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to China proper in a minute, okay. but I think this one's going to cost somewhere in the $20,000 range. Sure. It's predecessor, the rooster, was 169,000 Hong Kong dollars. Right, which it's, is what? Like, uh, it's like $21,500. Okay, so it's going to be in the range for any really gold, uh, gold LUC. Cool thing about this watch, in my opinion, is that it has the horological, you know, value yeah. as the LUCs bring, right? Um, but, you know, putting the time and the effort and the worksmanship into this dial each one is hand painted, right? So no two are going to be truly alike, right? Of course, whenever you have something that's hand painted and it's not enamel, it, it is lacquer, and right. the process is excruciating. Apparently, it takes years to extract the the lacquer itself from tree resin. So this is a long Jeez. process. It's not just the craft of the dial here, folks. Mm -hmm. So an interesting piece on a lot of levels, and I, I thought it would be interesting to ask, what do you think? Since you've sold many regional market specials right. for every market, mm -hmm. the question becomes. Watches like the Panerai Pam 66 Fu from 2010, right. mm -hmm. the Fu dial. Watches like the Ulysse Norden Classico Year of the Rooster from, from this model year. Watches like even the Patek Leap 5531 New York City Minute Repeater World Time. Sure. And I don't have a picture of it because I didn't think it was a very distinctive example. So I'm going to go with the Resence USA Edition Type 5. And Cap is going to stand in for Resence right here. But the Resence USA Edition Type 5. Josh, are these regional models all the same and that they're too focused or broadly appealing or does it really matter by edition? Yeah, without a doubt it's by edition. So um, if you're going to do say a a year of the dog uh, you know, zodiac edition and you're, you're targeting Japanese audience, if you put the Japanese flag on that on that watch it's certainly going to limit things. But doing it this way where you have an Akita hand painted on a dial of a watch that has historical va or uh, horological value, I think this is possibly the way to do it, though this one is specific. So unless you're an Akita owner, um, someone who was born in the year of the dog, or is someone who wants to collect each and every one of these uh, Zodiac watches, it's gonna be specific. But broadly, the less specific you, be, you are on the dial, specifically. So the regional market that doesn't become too much of a pigeonhole piece, right. that exactly. has transcendent appeal, yeah. that's the one that's going to hold value long term. Otherwise, you've got to just be a huge fan of the Chinese zodiac, Japanese culture, mm -hmm. Arushi lacquer, or this dog. Correct. <laughs> okay, I like that. It's a great dog, though. Look at it. By the way, guys, Josh is chatting live in oh, our I live am. chat box. So open up the live chat box if you're watching and talk to Josh because when I'm talking, he's typing, and when he's talking, I'm typing. The guy that says a blog to watch in the chat box, that's actually us. All right, I can see JBO Surf, I can see Vizsler, I can see Cap and Zed, longtime viewers joining us, new friends, welcome. This is This Week in Watches from Watchbox Studios on a blog to watch. You can see us weekly on the Watchbox Studios YouTube channel. Subscribe. All right. So I will say that uh, Chopard spread the love around. We're going to roll back a little bit. And we've got a graphic for China proper. This is the Chopard LUC Perpetual Tea Spirit of the Chinese Zodiac. Oh, this yeah. one is Eastern Baroque completely engraved with the entire Chinese zodiac. This is a tourbillon, this is a perpetual calendar, this is engraved, this is a chronometer, and yes, this is Geneva Hallmark movement and case. A special piece and a piece unique. I have no idea what it's gonna sell for, but I shared it because it's beautiful and I think you'd appreciate it. I certainly did. All right, guys, so we're moving on to our new watches, and we are actually going to be 
staying on the Chopard trail here because I want to recommend the best article that I read this week and it was from a blog to watch and this is where Ariel Adams gives us our article of the week and I think that it was his November 13th Chopard LUC Lunar One Perpetual Calendar Review. A watch being made in a hundred pieces in platinum. This is a real watch nerd watch and I think you'll appreciate the way he attacks his analysis of it. Discusses things like the underrated status of Chopard's LUC series. Really one of those best kept secrets and hiding out in the open. Also a hidden gem among the established ultra haute de gamme brands. He also discusses the concept of relative value in the ultra high horology space and how this watch at I believe just over 63,000 represents an interesting alternative to the usual suspects from the Holy Trinity. I would also say that he broaches a concept that's often debated which is the legitimacy of oversized dress watches because this is no sports watch but at 43 millimeters we're definitely well beyond traditional dress watch territory. Check this out on a blog to watch Open a separate tab, keep us streaming, but this is one you're going to want to read. Okay, new watches continuing, guys. We have Audemars Piguet and a special occasion even by Ooh. their exalted standards. Now, nice. an anniversary that deserves the name because we know watch companies love to call one, two, three year anniversaries of like a ladies jewelry piece no one's ever heard of. <laughs> this is a name brand here. It's Audemars Piguet celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Royal Oak Offshore. Now, the reference 26 237 ST is the one I think everyone's going to love. 50 pieces in steel, this is going to be uncontroversial because this is the original 1993 design reissued. They did this one time in 2013 with 20 pieces. That was the 26, I want to see 218 reference. Hardly ever seen. This is the second appearance of that original 93 reissued. Everyone loves it. And at just over $20,000, the price is right for such a scarce commodity. Yeah. It's the reference 26421 that is going to spur the debate. And I think it's likely to draw the most attention as well. Whether in steel or in rose gold, this is an extreme design that will leave none indifferent. Now, I will say the 2002 Royal Oak concept that really began the series of absolutely off the wall, complicated, extreme, oversized Royal Oak designs was also awesome. controversial in its time. But believe me, all 150 pieces found loving owners and they traded a premium today. So here's the question. Is this mechanically magnificent caliber, which which is seven day power reserve and a tourbillon and a chronograph enough to justify a price of 285,000 to 325,000 Swiss francs, hmm. 50 pieces total. Josh, what's your take here? Who well, buys this watch? Well, it's going to be an AP collector who's going to be buying this watch, right? Someone who's tycooning really hard. Maybe you just sold a bunch of Bitcoin that's <laughs> skyrocketing. Yeah, hold and you have some extra. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right now, definitely hold. How's uh, your one Bitcoin doing, by the way? Uh, my fraction of one Bitcoin is slowly <laughs> increasing in value. His bits of bits is on a winning streak. <laughs> yeah. Continue. Okay, but um, so this, so it's a. It's a great watch for an AP collector. It's not highly wearable. Um, I'd say that the concepts are probably a little bit more wearable than this watch. I haven't seen it in person, obviously. Um, but from the looks of it, it's going to be huge. Yes. Right. So um, I'd say that the, the re-edition, the 30-year re-edition, is going to be something that's going to be uh, much more in demand, obviously, than the these you know concept re-editions. But, okay. um, I mean, the, they're, they're always going to find a risk. And right now, AP is so highly on fire that... They're not going to have any problem selling these at retail. That's true. These watches will never hit the market. None of these watches will ever appear in a case mm. in a dealer. No. I think, guys, if we can pull up the 2642 one more, one more time, the Tourbillon Chronograph, this is a watch is. that is, is so out of this world. Right. It's like that, Art Deco, right? I mean, the amount of energy that goes into making it gives it inherent value. Mm -hmm. It is beautiful. It takes you beyond your comfort zone. This is not Gerald Genta. This is not 1972. This isn't even 1993. This is a 21st century interpretation of what a special occasion should be in the life cycle of one of the most important oversized sports watch references of the modern era. Yeah. So I would say, look, go big, go bold, or go home. And don't be afraid to piss some people off. And I think AP's done that. Yeah. And they're going to find people who love this watch and the people who don't forget them. Yeah, it seems like that's kind of the new attitude of the brand itself. You know, they're, they are... You know, reinvesting in themselves, you see that their watches are gaining value uh, and market value is going sh skyrocketing. Their watches are, you don't see them being discounted. You see that the brand, the direction that the win brand went in, say about two, two and a half years ago, has been, yes. has been taking them basically skyrocketing. So um, while right. maybe if, they, if this was released five years ago, it probably would have flopped. The same watch with the same amount of effort and the same price uh, released now is probably going to be a hit. Yeah, just, just 
you know, for the record, guys, I prefer the traditionalist re-edition. This is watch for someone with a budget and audacity. <laughs> so continuing on, exist. I think it's important to note that when we talk about watch style, whenever possible, we try to talk about the people who designed the watches. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that we have Ariel Adams of a blog to watch who is gracious enough to answer a question from our viewers. Uh, this AP 25th anniversary discussion really brings design to the fore. And architects, auto and fashion designers are stars, and they might even be household names in some cases, but with the exception of historic scholarship in the watch space, we seldom know the names of the men and women behind the likes of Rolex, Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantin, and other top brands. Why is that, and will we ever know? Ariel answers. Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here from a blog to watch. I'm gonna answer another question for the audience. This question is, will we ever know the names of the designers of today's Rolex, Omega, or even Patek Philippe, i.e. high lux watches, the way we know Gerald Genta, George Heisek, and Emmanuel Guit from previous generations? This is an excellent question, and I agree that there seems to be a disconnect between the people that design watches and the people that make watches and the people that buy watches. Very few of us know the actual person responsible for the designs of many of the watches that we most admire. And that's actually not by accident. Brands, especially Swiss brands, are highly protective of this information. Oftentimes these brands hire outsiders to assist with a range of things, ranging from design to production uh, to refinement to all kinds of things that they oftentimes don't want you to know about. And even if they do, they really want to focus all the attention on them, especially when products are new. So my first response to this question is that at the time when Gerald Genta and George Heisek, for example, were designing for other brands, most people didn't know who they were. It, it was, you know, 1972, the Royal Oak came out. And other watches like the, like the Nautilus, um, the, the and, and a lot of other watches that were designed by Gerald Genta. No one really knew it was from Gerald, G Gerald Genta. It was Audemars Piguet or Patek Philippe that got the credit. It wasn't until later that I understand people knew these names. George Heisek is a little bit uh, more of a recent designer. He did things for... Tag Heuer, for example. And he's not particularly known for that, but he is known for the High Sick brand, which he's actually no longer associated with. I know him personally. He's a nice, humble guy, but I wouldn't say that he sits there and thinks about the designs he made in the past. I don't know that he has the emotional connection to them that a lot of the the people that like their watches do. Gerald Genta is no longer with us, but he is sort of famous for saying things like, I don't really like watches. He was a very good designer of watches coming from someone that didn't really like watches. And so I think it's important for people to understand that not all watches today um, are, are essentially, or in the past, have been designed by people who consider themselves serious watch lovers. You do have niche brands, uh, smaller brands, that very much focus the person behind the design. And these brands follow what I call the art market in terms of the trend of focusing on the artist as opposed to the work. The artist, the popularity of the artist, the story of the artist is what helps sell the work. And brands like MBNF have been very good at capitalizing on that, focusing as much on the people as the things they create. So I do think that in the future, because there is such a robust community of people to talk about watches, the timepieces that today are popular, it will be discovered who designed them. More conversations will come, but during their production life cycle, or at least the initial production life cycle, the brands aren't going to make that information particularly well known because they want to have the they want to take credit themselves for understandable business reasons. So going back to the question. Will we ever know the names of, of designers of today's watches? Perhaps we will, but it'll be a little bit after the fact. It'll be several years from now, ideally before these individuals pass away. Another thing which is important to remember is that <clears throat> a lot of today's watches are designed to look like older watches or inspired by older watches. So the design of watches today is very different than the design of watches when watches were still a utilitarian item that everybody needed. Cars today are the same type of thing. There's luxury cars and there's standard cars, but ultimately everyone needs a car. So there's a lot more attention around car design because it is a practical item that the rich and the poor um, together both rely on, whereas watches, at least for luxury watches, are intended only for a specific audience that are purchasing them for reasons outside of their mere utility. So I think that 
today we'll actually know more and more about the people designing the truly original watches, but someone like Rolex, you have to ask yourself, yes, of course they hire designers, but are they really coming up with a lot that's new, or are they making small derivative works based upon timepieces from the past, and is the contribution of the designers that are making those things as important as those guys like Gerald Genta, for example, that came up with a lot of arguably much more original work. So that's an interesting question to ask. But again, I do think that more of the names today um, involved in the design of popular watches will come out. We're just going to have to wait. Thank you. All right. So that was Ariel Adams on the whole concept of identifying the basically the people behind our watches. Now there are some celebrities today who are designer names such that their brands will endorse their participation and reveal it, but a lot of times you just have to wait. Wait for the right watch scholar in the long run to unveil the man behind the machine or the woman in many cases mm -hmm. these days. Remember, it wasn't known that Gerald Genta actually created the Patek Philippe Nautilus and the Royal Oak until many years later, principally due to Japanese wristwatch scholars who unearthed that information. So stay tuned, we may know yet. Pick your favorite and then play the waiting game. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about industry news because the industry is always moving and it's not just new watches. First, BLBN Switzerland, whichever side of the Teutonic or Francophone side you fall, the bottom line is this border city in Switzerland welcomed a new Omega facility. Now, it was inaugurated by the CEO of this watch group, Mr. Nick Hayek, the president and CEO of Omega, Reynold Ashleman, and actually the architect, we talk about star architects, the star architect, Shigeru Ban, who designed the five-floor facility. Now, the facility itself is going to have several different jobs. It's going to be engaged in watchmaking, final assembly and regulation, assembly of bracelets and clasps, watchmaker and artisan training, as well as quality control and logistics. The interesting thing, too, is that it's going to be a METAS Master Chronometer Certification Center. So if you're familiar with the METAS Chronometer Standard, and we've got a METAS Chronometer movement right there, mm -hmm. the work will be done in-house at the new five-floor facility. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is interesting because it's part of an automated quality control and assembly process that Omega has largely implemented using robotics technology. There are going to be conveyors and elevators operated mostly autonomously using low-level AI and sensors to bring the parts from the storeroom to the watchmakers who are working on individual models, bringing in parts and tools that are correct to the reference. Now this actually parallels Rolex's highly automated assembly process that's used in Geneva. So this is not just a sign of Omega investing in the future, but also keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. I will say this is the latest step in a journey that started in the early 1990s for Omega when it was a grand but somewhat faded nameplate. Its luster had diminished somewhat from its heyday in the 50s and 60s and 70s. They've gone from being sort of a comeback kid in the 90s focusing on event sponsorship and product placement and celebrity ambassadors to a truly impressive watchmaking operation that trades equally on its name and horological value with exclusive calibers and now in-house watchmaking. Very impressive, Omega, I have to say, all things considered. Well done. Rolex, your move. Okay, so in L.A., everything comes full circle like a bad movie. And, of course, we are broadcasting on a blog to watch based in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that I first met Ariel Adams almost three years ago in a dinner at L.A.'s Mr. Chow. Upscale Asian fusion, it turned into a bit of a food fight as I flung greasy noodles in medieval siege style, trebuchet-like, across the table, and Ariel dumped a cup of water on me in retaliation. That said, we have a little bit more, shall we say, upscale news out of L.A. this time of year. Three mm. years later, Grand Seiko is making the splash, not Ariel Adams. <laughs> Sorry, terrible spilt water pun, Ariel. My apologies. So Grand Seiko news. On Thursday, November 16th, L.A.'s Rodeo Drive welcomed a Grand Seiko boutique that is significant because it becomes the world's first Grand Seiko exclusive boutique. Now, of course, the brand was relaunched this year at Basel World. The removal of the standalone Seiko name from the dial is supposed to parallel a new spirit of independence from the rest of the Seiko Epson empire. So Grand Seiko will have the first boutique to focus exclusively on Grand Seiko timepieces, which we love. They offer tremendous value. I had a question previously about great value that's outside the trinity of Omega, Rolex, and Breitling. 
Look to the east, look to Grand Seiko. Mm -hmm. Great watches, this is an extension of the Basel World rebranding. It's going to take a long time to hammer home the idea that Seiko and Grand Seiko are not the same thing to a general audience, right. but this is a step in the right direction. It was kind of a big deal, too. As LAVIPs turned out, the president and COO of Seiko Watch Corporation was there, the mayor of Beverly Hills was there, the general or the consul general of Japan in LA was there. So kind of a big ribbon cutting. I think that uh, this is going to be a big step forward for Japanese horology in the United States. Again, we love the models. The tech is there. The craft is there. We need to spread the word. And now there's a West Coast based to kind of counterpin the other Seiko boutiques in the US, which are in the Miami Design District and in Manhattan and New York City. Now they've got a stake in the West Coast. So you're going to be able to see unique technologies such as spring drive, Zeratsu flawless optical polishing, high beat movements, great stuff, products from Crador too, which is the apex brand of mm -hmm. Grand Seiko, such as the spring drive sonnery that you see right there, a spectacular watch. We actually had it in town at Golfburg last year. Worth, hey, if they charged admission to this boutique, it would be worth the price of wow. admission to hear this. So. I can see this becoming a destination for watch tourism in the United States and Canada. Also, it might be a beacon for watch tourism across the Pacific Rim, since we know that at any given time, any part of the Pacific Rim might be terrorized by mechs, monsters, or mechs and monsters. Hey, <laughs> if you need to get away from it all, we've got L.A. So, Josh, let me ask you a question. What do you yes, think sir. of the Grand Seiko brand? We really... I mean, honestly, we've really only been involved in it since we joined with Gothberg. Right. What's your impression since? Well, so I'm learning a lot about uh, Grand Seiko every day. With the guys in our office who are totally obsessed and know everything there is to know about these watches, so I'm learning a little bit more. And what I what I realize is it's, while the design, the fit and finish is fantastic, they're all somewhat similar. It's really about what's inside these watches that really, you know, sets them apart. Um, so... That being said, I, I'm starting to like these watches. I think I'm probably going to add one to my collection, say, in the next 6, 12 months, right? Um, I, will, I will say the splitting the Seiko from the Grand Seiko is a good idea. Um, somebody on the chat mentioned something about how, you know, having the Rolex and the Tudor kind of idea going on, which this is actually in reverse. Um, I think that's a great, I think they're doing a great job. These these watches do hold value from a resale value uh, standpoint. Yes. Like we're, as dealers, we're paying good money for these watches pre-owned. The price point is low enough where you're never going to take a crazy hit because you're never going to be spending a crazy amount of money on these watches. And then the Cradors, even that are fifty, sixty thousand dollars or even a hundred thousand dollars, tend to be limited enough and not discounted through retails and retailers enough to dis to destroy their value. So distribution's handled well from a business standpoint. The watches. I mean, they always work. I can't remember the last one, last one that we saw that came back. And that's service. true because a lot. You know, we're not going to name names here, but a lot of companies <laughs> do have a high defect rate where mm -hmm. new watches go back for service. We're not naming names, <laughs> but I can tell you that Grand Seiko was never on that list. So that's the true. quality control that you're getting. Right. I mean, there are watches that are three, four, five times the price that sometimes go back to the right. manufacturer. Grand Seiko has never been one of those brands where no. you even have a second thought about handing off the timepiece to a customer. Right. And you know, the value, the value that you're getting there is super important because no matter how how well you handle distribution, if your watches don't work and you got to pay for large um, service bills, then it's going to kill the value of your watch. And, you know, the Japanese are known for putting out high-quality goods when it comes to cars and other things like that. They're passing it on to, to their watches. When I was in college, there were, like, Japanese super fans of Japanese culture. They were, like, American otaku. And they'd be like, Tim, let me tell you, <laughs> guitars, whiskey, <laughs> computers, Cars, watches, everything Japanese is better, Tim. I'm right. like, you are a true believer, man. But I can tell you this, Grand Seiko needs no hype. It, it lives up to the legend and it's a great value in watches. Yeah, seems so good. A watch nerd brand, this is, I think, a great step toward taking it beyond that threshold. Yeah. All right, so a question came through. We had a question about sub-date, Damo666, a man after my own heart, another dark lord, asked, Submariner date or no date, Josh, which is your choice and no. why? No date, just because you don't need the date. Date, you know what date is. No, but it's it's yeah. a little bit it's it's a little bit less expensive, which is uh, usually more collectible when you go towards a brand that holds value. Go towards the least expensive sport uh, stainless steel sport watch. Yes. So it holds more value, more trade. It's you know. Uh, they're traded more highly, and um, it just, yeah, it's yeah. my preference. I Look, guess. if you want to play Bond, 
I mean, the real Bond, Sean right. Connery, you need a no date. Uh, for me, right? look, I, I love nice things. So I love the, the LB. I love the blue ceramic, blue lacquer dial of the white gold model. That would be my ideal Submariner, but I'm not a Rolex purist, and I'm not a sports watch purist. So I'm the wrong person to ask. So I think we've got a tied, we've got a hung jury. That's the consequence of having two hosts. Oh, well. So 666, it's up to you. You're the <laughs> tie-breaking vote. There you go. All right. So moving along, actually, we're not done with Japanese horology, guys. I would normally say at the lower, more accessible end of the price spectrum, we find G-Shock, but mm. that's not the case here. So big news for uh, you American otaku. G-Shock now turns 35 in the year 2018. It's been 35 years since uh, Kikuo Ibe's masterpiece. And November 9th, 2017, at Madison Square Garden, there was a G-Shock party in New York City. Uh, there's Mr. Ibe himself. Normally, I wouldn't care about these kind of festivities because, frankly, I wasn't there and I wasn't invited. But all the same, it was an important event because huge spoiler alert, folks. I haven't really heard much of this outside of social media. But Mr. Ibe displayed a G-Shock DW5600 Sapphire prototype in clear sapphire and in red. Now, we've discovered that this is sapphire with carbon fiber trim. Allegedly a 2018 limited edition model by order only that takes a month to craft and costs a hundred thousand dollars I have seen nothing about this outside of Casio nerd circles, so we're a little bit ahead of the curve here And maybe I'm preempting an announcement and this never happens But the rumor is that this is happening and if that's the case then I think we've got a one hundred thousand dollar face-off between the Ublo spirit of Big Bang Sapphire mm -hmm and the new 2018 G-Shock anniversary. Go at it, this is a clash of titans. Again, it's a hard monsters pick. and mechs. Yeah. Okay, so Josh, what do you think of this? Is, is this a mistake, or is this a good move on a limited basis? I mean, it depends on how limited it is. If they make five of them, there's no such thing as a mistake, but there's so many G-Shock fans, and myself included, I be, my first watch I ever purchased was a G-Shock, it was actually purchased for me by my now wife that we were, we were dating in high school. Um, and I probably, I don't know, I have maybe 10, 15, G-Shocks, so I think it's super cool the fact that I can buy a watch from a company that makes a watch like this. Um, making sapphire cases is awesome. Uh, I'm not, listen, if you guys watch me, I'm not the biggest Hublot fan, though I do have respect for certain models, you know, the Unicos and things like that. So their sapphire, uh, their sapphire watches, the sapphire Unicos specifically are ones that I really like. Anybody who can make a watch, uh, a watch bracelet and case fully out of sapphire, I have respect yeah. for. This is going to be a this is going to be a one-time thing. Like this is going to go to super fans. This is a little right. bit like the AP Royal Oak Offshore Tourbillon Chronograph, yeah. a watch that's so even for Audemars Piguet out there that you have to already get the brand and like bleed company colors. I think if you bleed G-Shock mm -hmm. and you know you've got blood like you know vulcanized butyl tires <laughs> like a G-Shock watch. I will say this, I have a very soft spot in my heart because like a lot of watch enthusiasts, it all started with a G-Shock. In 1998, my parents gave me a G-Shock for Christmas. I was a kid in middle school and I have to say, almost 20 years later as we approach 2018, that watch still works. Wow. Mr. eBay's goal was a 10-year watch back in 1983 and I have to say, Kikuo eBay, mission accomplished. That's awesome. All right. so. Though if you're buying it for you know resale value, probably stay away from it because yeah. I don't know, I don't know any dealers that would be in the G Shark market regardless of what, you know what the price point is. It's just super cool to buy you uh, watch you buy and keep and just you know wear it to the movies and, and just know that you yeah. got a hundred thousand hey, dollars. Flaunt in, in front of people who know. Anyone who recognizes the hundred thousand dollar G Shock is oh, someone yeah. I want to know because that's, that's right. a nerd and that's me. <laughs> okay, so like looking in the mirror. Okay, speaking of mirror images, JBO Surf has a great question, and that is: Is there a Japanese Jorn, an independent maker, high horology? Not someone who makes as many watches as Jorn, but you do have some AHCI members in Japan. Uh, Hajime Asayoka probably along with Masahiro Kokuno, the two most accomplished. With those guys, every watch, they, they have some templates, like suggestions, you can order this model, but everything's still built to order. So really, your imagination and their willingness is the limit, but definitely go to the AHCI website. You can see all of the members and where they're from. Not only are there independents taking bespoke orders in Japan today, there are independents in China taking orders today. Some of them make clocks, but some of them make watches. The AHCI world and independent horology always expanding. Mm -hmm. So Hajime Asayoka, Masahiro Kokuno, check them out. I think you'll like what you see. Mm. All right. 
So I must say, this brings us to the conclusion of our program tonight. Uh, I want to remind everyone you can follow Mr. Thanos, Mr. Underscore Thanos, on Instagram. And you can no follow underscore. Tim Underscore Masso. Yeah, no underscore. Just but Mr. Thanos. Tim Underscore Masso on Instagram to keep an eye spied on my world and what I'm seeing here at thewatchbox.com. I also implore you to visit our new website at thewatchbox.com. It's fun, it's fast, it's easy to use, and if you check our new arrivals page, you can try to beat me to the next Cheshire Lecoult minute repeater that comes in. Good luck. I'll also say this, next Friday, Black Friday, we're gonna be live, same place, same time. So join us here on a blog to watch, Watchbox Studios Live on Black Friday. For one day, I get to live my dream of being the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> Watchbox, Black Friday, a blog to watch. I'll see you then. Guys, have a great weekend. I'm Tim, he's Josh, this is Watchbox on a blog to watch, and thanks for logging on.